to your love that we would see like never before. Give us a greater glimpse of a never changing God. All we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus. Everything glory is found in you, found in you. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free and he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died. There's a place for 
in Psalm 36, verse 5, it says, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Father, as we continue to worship you, may we see so abundantly clear the light that you bring forth. May may you be the delight of our hearts. May we worship you with all we have. Though we may not feel like we have much to bring, we want to bring it all to you no matter what it is. And lay it at your feet as an offering of pure heart and pure worship. Let's continue to sing to our King this morning of his steadfast love. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today. Faithful you have been, faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise with ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You father the orphan, your kindness makes us whole, and you shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, you're clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes, for you will have your bride. Free of all our guilt and rid of all our shame and known by our true name. And it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Yes, you will be praised, yeah. you will be praised. With angels and saints we sing worthy, are you, Lord? You will be praised, you will be praised. You will be praised with angels and saints. We sing, Worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised. You will be praised with angels and saints. We sing, Worthy are you, Lord. It's your praise will ever be. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips.
be close, close to your side, so heaven is real, and death is a lie, I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one, hallelujah, holy, holy, God almighty, Great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, the great I am. I want to be near, near your heart, loving the see dry bones living again singing as one hallelujah holy holy god almighty the great i am who is worthy none beside thee god almighty and shake before him the demons run and flee at the mention of the name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power shake before him the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power in the presence of the great i am the great i am the great 
Father, we stand in awe of you. Lord, you are holy. And there's nothing that compares to your presence, Lord. May we constantly stand in awe and in reverence of your holiness, Lord. For you are the great I am. Lord, there's none like you. You are faithful. You are steadfast. You are true. You are love. God, I pray that our hearts would desire, that they would hunger to know you more, to be deeper in relationship with you, that we would be more like your son. And if we have not made Jesus our Lord and Savior, I pray that we would do so today. That we could rejoice in new life, a new creation, Lord. That we could step with our Savior, that we could be more like Him. Help us to be more like you, Jesus. We thank you for your love and for your grace, for dying on the cross, Lord. If we haven't set our minds there yet, may we do so right now. For the price you paid on the cross, that we might have life in you, Jesus. And it's in your powerful name I pray. Amen. Let's take our Bible this morning, uh, please, and turn to the book of 2 Thessalonians as we uh, look at one of the letters to the church uh, from the Apostle Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy as they wrote to the church at Thessalonica. I also want to ask you to, uh, if you got a bulletin when you came in, you, one of these should have been on the inside of it. It's just a little note card and if you got one, if you'll take this out, uh, if you didn't get one, just take out something that you can uh, write with or write on, and um, I want to ask you to to, uh, to do a little exercise with me this morning, um, and just, I think note-taking is a good deal, so when you get all the O's filled in in your bulletin, then you can uh, track along with us, all right? So I want you to take this card if you would, or if you, whatever whatever you use to take notes or journal in, and but you kind of draw a line down the middle. I don't know if anybody has ever said to you when you're trying to make a decision to, uh, to make a little chart and put the positive on one side and the negative on the other, the pros on one side or the cons on the other. And so just kind of make a line down the middle of that page. And at the top of the left-hand column, I want you to write the word expectations. I'm at a bit of disadvantage because I've never chosen where I was going to go to church. My dad was a pastor, so it was chosen for us where we were going to go to church. And I went into ministry when I was 18, and so I've never, I've never chosen a church. It was always chosen for me. You say, we had a choice. Well, I hadn't had many invites, okay? <laughs> um, but it was it was that was that was a choice that was made for me. 
when I think about what kind of a church would I choose, oftentimes we look at things that are expectations for us. What do we expect from a church? Well, we want a church that's, uh, man, that's, that's clean, a safe environment. That, that's a good thing. Those are things that we ought to want. And we, we say, well, I, I, uh, I expect a church to have a great um, age-graded ministry, to have a strong children's ministry and student ministry and young adult, those kind of things. And, and, and those are great things. Those are things that we, that we, should, be, that we should be about. Maybe we think about our expectations when it comes just to our convenience. We want to be able to, we want to be able to park close by and not have to walk a ways. I want to be able to walk in and sit in a the choice seat near the back. And that's what we expect. And there's so many expectations that we have when it comes to church. I want, I, I want, I want great music. I, I want, um, I want uh, solid preaching that's not over a certain decibel and, and not too confrontational. God's teaching me that just because a point's louder doesn't make it better or right. We look for so many things, and we have so many expectations when it comes to the church. The other side of that coin, and you can write this over the right-hand side of your column, I want you to write the word commands. You see, there are certain things that the church was meant to be about when you read what God was doing and how God was working in the life of the church in Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed to the, the proceeds as, uh, to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their bread with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. A gentleman named Daniel M. I. M. has written a book to the church called No Silver Bullets. He says the myth of the silver bullet still exists because we desperately want it to. We all prefer quick fixes and bandaged solutions to the long, hard, slow work that produces real change. So the moment we learn about a new ministry or strategy and see its effects in, an, effects in another church, we run to implement, implement it in our own. Church is not about my expectations. It's not about discovering what is the silver bullet that can keep the church, that thing, what is the next thing that, that comes along. I'm simply naive enough to believe that if we would come back to the commands of Scripture, if we would come back to the pattern of the church established by the Lord Jesus Christ laid out for us in Acts chapter 2, we don't need a silver bullet. We need to follow the pattern of the Word of God. And when we do that, I'm naive enough to believe that the Lord is going to begin to continually add to the church. I read a statement in Letters to the Church that Francis Chan said, My entire life, the church has been in decline. And I read over that statement, and I read over it and over and over again. It's a sad state of affairs for the church. And our answer to turning it around is that what is the silver bullet? If we could simply fulfill everyone's expectation, and I don't mean to beat anybody up here. I'm not after anybody in here. I'm after everybody in here, including me. If, if this is all about people's expectations, we will never fulfill everyone's expectations. I'm sorry to disappoint you. 
And that's a difficult statement for me because of my people-pleasing, driven nature. That it isn't about my expectations. It's about what the Word of God says. What His church is to be. Paul makes this statement in First, excuse me, in Second Thessalonians chapter one, and this is a statement I've, uh, I've, uh, man, have just really, even since the early hours of this morning, read over and over and over again, and God has just penetrated my heart with this statement. And it's a simple statement that may be easier for us to read over. He says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, Therefore, and we'll talk about the therefore in a moment. But here's the statement. We ourselves boast about you among God's churches. you got to remember, Paul's a guy who had seen a lot. He had been in a lot of churches, most of which he started himself. And so Paul says, as I look at all the churches I've I've, I've been around, I've, I've been in, I've been a part of, of all the churches that I've started, he said, I would have to say about the Thessalonians that this is a church that is different. There's something special, there is something significant about this church. I boast about them above every other church. And then he begins to tell us why that statement is true. They were a church that believed and taught the Scripture, we must always be a church that believes and teaches the Scripture. As Baptists, we have always prided ourselves in being a people of the book. We grew up singing the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Get the new look from the old book. All, all of the, even, even our hymns, Wonderful Words of Life, which we like to skip over, the last part of the second verse, teach me, teach me truth and, and duty. We grew up learning to sing the books of the Bible. If you're like me, if you forget the words, you just sing watermelon over and over and again. When I get to the minor prophets, it's watermelon, watermelon. I don't, I, I can't. And trying to sing all that, I can't even speak them all. <laughs> Before you get too critical, they didn't learn us that in seminary. So there you go. We we won sword drills. Some of you are old school, remember when you had Bible drill, sword drill. Took your Bible, attention, draw swords, charge, and you had to find a verse in the Bible. It was some random, tucked away somewhere in second conclusions or something, you know, and you're just like, man, i got to go to index. I never even heard of it. But we grew up thinking, man, we're people of the book. We're a people of the Bible. We believe that the Bible is, and we use words like infallible and inerrant, and I believe it's true. But we live in a culture today where we must shift our focus from our expectations back to the teaching of Scripture. What does the Bible say? Because there is a path of deception that many people were joining Paul said in chapter 2, verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. You see, the the reality of deception is an ever-present reality. And it's it's, it's easier to communicate it in our culture today than it ever has been before. In the medium of television, I sat with my mom last night at, at our family birthday celebration. And 
she was telling me, she said, well, I, I, I got really mad the other night. I was watching a TV program about, she said, Joe and Tammy Faye Baker. And I said, I think it's Jim, but go on with the story. And, and uh, she said, I sat there and watched that. And she said, I, I just got so mad. I said, why didn't you quit watching it? She said, well, that's a good question. She said, that's an hour of my life I'll never get back. And I don't have very many hours. Your television and radio and, and the Internet, you know, thank you, Al Gore, for inventing the Internet because now we know truth because everything that's on there is real. It's so easy for people to be caught up in deception. It is so easy for us to get caught up in deception and that which destroys, annihilates deception in our life is the truth of God's Word. And we need to dig deep into His Word and hear what God has to say to us. I love to hear Jerry Wells preach. He was the pastor here prior to Dwayne Finley, who I followed. And Brother Jerry Wells makes the statement that the greatest commentary on the Bible is, is the Bible. It's its own commentary. And if you're like me, my, one of my favorite speakers and authors is Charles Swindoll, who writes commentaries. And I can get to the point that I think if Charles Swindoll told me it was Christmas, I'd, I'd, go, I'd go get a tree. You see, we can get to the place where we lean so strongly into others that we neglect our personal study of the Word of God. What does God have to say to me? How is God speaking into my life through His Word? Paul says to them in chapter 2 and verse 2, not to be easily upset or troubled either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us alleging that the day of the Lord has come. This message, this prophecy, or a letter supposedly coming from us. Look how he finishes the letter, chapter 3. Paul says, I, Paul, verse 17, am writing this greeting with my own hand, which is an authenticating mark in every letter this is how I write. Paul said, this is in my handwriting. I want you to know it's for me. That's what gives it authenticity. I am simply naive enough to believe that if God intended for it to be in this book, it is there, and this word is authentic. It's God speaking to us. I think Paul looked at them and said, you know, it's a... I mean, I boast about you because you're a people, you're a people of the book. But also because they prayed without ceasing. We must never stop praying on the right hand side under command number two, keep praying. I'm going to ask you a penetrating question. Would you say that prayer plays a meaningful, any meaningful role in the life of our church? We pray less and less in our churches. Prayer has a, a more insignificant role in the life of our churches. If we're not careful, it becomes something that helps us to transition to get us from one thing to another in a service. And it's the same thing over and over and over again. Francis Chan said in letters to the church, if prayer is not vital in your church, then your church is not vital. If you can accomplish your church's mission without a daily passionate prayer, then your mission is insufficient and your church is irrelevant. You see, prayer is our access to the power of God. Paul said in chapter 1, 
and verse 11, in view of this, we always pray for you that our God will make you worthy of his calling and by his power fulfill your every desire to do good work and your work produced by faith. The power of God is available to the church today if we will simply pray. I read a book when I was in seminary written by a guy named Carl Bates, and it was a book about the Holy Spirit. And he makes a statement in this book, and it stuck with me because I went, and I I went to, I was in seminary like in the dark ages, okay? I rode a covered wagon. It's been a long time ago. But he made a statement that, that God, I don't remember anything else about the book, but this stuck in my mind. He said that the Holy Spirit could withdraw from our churches and 95% of what we do would continue and we would even brag about its success. What are we doing in our churches that requires the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that comes through the power of prayer? The truth is we could do what we do without it. The power of God, 2 Thessalonians 1.12, I pray, I pray that you'll, you will be filled with His power for every good thing, for everything that you do, that, you, that it would be touched and be filled with the power of prayer. Look at the facing page, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray constantly. The New Living Translation says, Never stop praying. If I'm not the world's worst, I'm in the top one at rolling through stop signs. I want to scream at people. It says stop, not stay, for crying out loud. I've got places I need to be. <laughs> and, and I just kind of roll through. It, it, we, may, we, we may have stopped. Some of us, we're just kind of rolling through it. We need to focus in on our prayer life. He said, I boast about you because of the love that you have for one another. We must never stop loving and serving one another. It's a big enough deal that the first two things that Paul talks about as he introduces this letter... He writes these words in chapter 1, verse 3. We ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so. Since your faith is in flourishing, is flourishing, and that the love each one of you has for another is increasing. The love each one of you has for another is increasing. The love each one of you has for one another is increasing. Men, write this down. Valentine's Day this year is on February the 14th. Your wife says, yeah, he needs to write it down because he, he, can't, he can't remember. <laughs> In every relationship, there are highs and lows. And it ebbs and flows. Love isn't static. It doesn't stay the same. It's an old joke, but the guy asked an 85-year-old man who'd been married for over 50 years, do you tell your wife you love her? He said, I told her when we get married, if I ever change my mind, I'll let her know. I'll need to let her know. Our love is not static. It decreases and it increases. The same is true in every relationship of our life. We at times love people less, we at times love them more. And he says, I'm praying for you that you will have an ever-increasing love for one another, that you will show your love in ever-increasing ways. Their love for one another was growing. It was increasing. He says in, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 9 about brotherly love, we don't, you, you don't even need me to write to you because you yourselves are taught by God to love 
one another. In fact, John would tell us that if we don't love one another, then the love of God is not even in us. We're to love one another in ever-increasing ways. He boasted about them because of their service. and We must never stop serving the Lord. My dad was, uh, man, he, he was a Ford. He, dr- he drove Fords. And I don't know that he would even watch a GM commercial on TV. And I, I had a Ford once. And if you're a Ford person, please don't be offended by this. I, you're, you're on my prayer list. I remember telling my dad, hey, look, they uh, you know, had a little oval. I said, hey, look, they circled the problem. But this car, if you let it, if you let it idle, it was going to die. You had to keep revving it up. If you just let it idle, it was, it was going to die. I want you to look what Paul said, beginning in verse 6 of chapter 3. Now we command, that's the word that's written on the top on the right-hand side of your, of your sheet. Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother or sister who is idle and does not live according to the tradition you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you should imitate us. We were not idle among you. We did not eat anyone's food free of charge. Instead, we labored and toiled, working night and day, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. It is not that we don't have the right to support, but we did it to make ourselves an example to you so that you would imitate us. In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. For we hear that there are some among you who are idle. They are not busy, but busybodies. We idle too long, we're going to die. We're going to welt, welt. We're just going to wilt. And Paul said, I want you to be busy. Not idle, I want you to be busy. I don't want you to be a busy body. You all, you all know what that is in the South. We don't even need to talk about that and define it. Huh. He says, don't, don't be idle. This is a strong command. We may rev up occasionally, then we idle back down. We need to rev up to be busy to what the Lord has called us to be about. And then he said to them, I boast about you because of your commitment to the gospel. We must faithfully take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Chapter 1, verse 8, Paul said, we, we know that the law is, excuse me, I, that's 1 Timothy 1. I've got to turn my page back. Verse 8, when he takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God, on those who don't obey, obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I, I want you to understand this because I hear the statement, I don't think a loving God would send anyone to hell. God has never sent one person to hell. Every person who is in hell today or ever will be in hell is there because of their choice. Because they refuse to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says in chapter 2 verse 10, With every wicked deception among those who are perishing, they perish because they did not accept the love of the truth, and so be saved. Listen, if you don't know Jesus, I want you to know today, He loves you. And He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to save you from your sin. People are in hell because they refuse to 
respond to the gospel and to accept the love of Jesus Christ. But many are there because I have not personally taken the opportunity given to me by the Lord to share the gospel with them. We say we believe in a literal hell, but do we live like it? Do we church? Do we do church like we believe it? You see, here's our tension. I can rewind back to 1978 setting in personal and church evangelism with Dr. Roy Fish at Southwestern Seminary, and he said to us, boys, here's the problem. We become keepers of the aquarium and not fishers of men. It's more about people's expectation. Keeping everybody happy, keeping everybody content. Keepers of the aquarium and not fishers of men. I want to to read a few words to you if I could. We could go on and on about those who complain about dress, youth ministry, service times, are also the same people who have not shared their faith in months or years and couldn't care less about making disciples of the billions of people who have no idea who Jesus is. It's imperative that we differentiate between what we want and what God commands. Do you find it even a little bit discouraging that our children, rather than transforming others, our children are watching puppet shows about Jonah and learning songs with hand motions? Are you sure this is what we have to settle for because of our geographic location? It could be that we've been wasting our most precious resource in our children. It could be that we've been treating our greatest assets is obligation. Maybe it's our lack of expectation from younger kids that bleeds into the way we treat middle school kids in the church. We teach them as if their only goal is to refuse to drink or have sex. Then when they hit high school, we try to entertain them enough to keep them coming. Maybe we need to do more releasing and less taming. I'm not saying we should foolishly endanger them. I'm just wondering whether our habit of underestimating God's power in them may be a mindset we develop in them that continues through middle school, high school, and into adulthood. Maybe our lack of courage took a while to develop. Our kids are simply a case in point for the way we function in the church. We underestimate them. We're afraid of what will happen if we let them loose, so we keep them entertained, educated, and insulated. Through the years, Luann and I have tried to take our kids on a few vacations. We, we took them to Six Flags. It's been a long time ago. I think when we took our kids, it was Four Flags over Texas. They didn't have six yet. I remember looking at them standing on that asphalt is 180 degrees and looking at them saying, I paid good money to get you in here. You start having fun. We, we, we took a, it was like a three-week trip to get to the Grand Canyon. Went to the colored, de- the painted desert. It was like, gosh, <laughs> it was like nothing. I'm like, look at God's creation. I'm like, yeah, let, let's, let's go. I've seen it. We get to the Grand Canyon. If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, you take, you take kids to the Grand Canyon. It's like they walk over to the edge and they look over. And My family is just like your family. We're carnal just like you are. You look over the edge and you spit. That's just what you do. We're there like five minutes, and they're like, yeah, we're, we're good. My, there was a, 
book out years ago called The Family Who Camps Together Stays Together. Try that. I've written a sequel. The family who camps together ends up in counseling together. That's the way that rolls. You see, here's what I've discovered about vacations. Vacations have probably done more to warp my kids than anything I've ever done with them. But I'll tell you what has transformed them. It's taking them on a mission trip. them getting to watch you talk to people about the Lord, serve people. For some of us to see our kids do that, even when we haven't been willing to do it. To take them and to see what it's like in other cultures. And to experience that firsthand. For us, for the Fullers, and I think there are a room full of people who would share the same testimony. It's the most life transforming experience for our families and our kids than anything else we've ever done. Our goal is to find more creative ways to share with those who have dozens of who have heard dozens of times, and they know how to tell you what you want to hear, but we neglect the millions who have never heard the gospel. Remember what happened when they focused on these things. The Lord added to the church daily. Everyone was filled with with awe. I'm just crazy enough to believe if it worked in the first century, it'll work today. If we will simply focus on the Scripture, on prayer, love, on focus on loving one another, focus on ways how we can outserve one another, Focus on how we can faithfully take the gospel to the ends of the earth. I believe that we will be the kind of church, and prayerfully one day, the, the Lord Himself will speak to us and over us and about us. I boast about you among God's churches. Father, my prayer today is that our commands, that, that our expectations never become greater than your commands. God, that we never put our expectations with an equal sign with commands because they're not equal. This church is not about what I want. It's about what I need. God, I pray that your commands will always be greater than our expectations. Father, I pray for our church today. God, there are all kinds of churches and in the buckle of the Bible belt, the seemingly on every corner. God, I pray that we will be the church that you desire for us to be. And that individually we will come to this place of prayer today, or we'll build an altar where we are right now. God, that you would look at us, that you would smile upon us, that you would nod in favor, you would speak to us and over us. Here's a great church that's doing what I call them to do, that's fo focusing on my commands and not their expectations. God, help us today to be that church in a world that desperately needs that kind of church. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.